One world currency. The new world order. Those are the roots of trouble. I imagine that right now you're feeling a bit like Alice. Tumbling down the rabbit hole? Hmm? Let me tell you why you're here. You're here because you know something. What you know you can't explain. But you feel it. You felt it your entire life. That there's something wrong with the world. You don't know what it is. But it's there. Like a splinter in your mind. Driving you mad. It is this feeling that has brought you to me. This is your last chance. After this there is no turning back. You take the blue pill. The story ends. You wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want. You take the red pill. You stay in Wonderland. And I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. All I'm offering is the truth. Nothing more. Well, we are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that relies primarily on covet means for expanding its sphere of influence. On infiltration instead of invasion on subversion instead of election, on intimidation instead of free choice, on guerrillas by night instead of armies by day. It is a system which has conscripted vast human and material resources into the building of a tightly knit, highly efficient machine that combines military, diplomatic, intelligence, economic, scientific, and political operations. Its preparations are concealed, not published. Its mistakes are buried, not headlined. Its dissenters are silenced, not praised. No expenditure is questioned, no rumor is printed, no secret is revealed. But I am asking your help in the tremendous task of informing and alerting the American people. And now, welcome to another episode of Down the Rabbit Hole. Here's your host from FederalJack.com. It's Popeye. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another live edition of DTRH. It is September 11th, 2014. The 13 year anniversary of the attacks of September 11th. The events that changed our lives drastically here in this country. Changed our world. You constantly hear politicians in the news referring to pre-9-11 and post-9-11. The pre-9-11 mindset as opposed to the post-9-11 mindset. Because that's what they had to do. They had to use the event to change our minds. I'm going to present some more evidence to you tonight again showing you that the facts are that the events of 9-11 did not happen the way that we've been told they did. It's as simple as that. Once you can accept that, then you are willing to do the research. And once you do the research, the facts that present themselves to you, the overwhelming facts that present themselves to you, will destroy the official myth that you've been told. Because that's what the official 9-11 story is. It's a myth. Tonight, I'm going to present to you another documentary. I've been playing a few of them all week. Now, there are a lot of movies out there that I would suggest that you take the time to at least watch, take some notes, and do further research. And don't, just because you see the movie, or hear the audio here on my broadcast, assume that you're a genius and an expert in the subject. Far from it, I suggest you go and take the time to do the research Consider this more of a, um, more of me going just going over it in a broad sense to pique your interest, because that's what I'm really doing. I could sit here for hours and go over every minute detail that I know, but you really won't absorb it all. You'll absorb about half of it, maybe, to the hardcore listeners, to the newer people they'll probably absorb maybe 10% of it, 15% of it, to people that are just looking into 9-11 that might stumble across this live broadcast or the archive version of it later on. It's better for you to go to the water and drink yourself. 
What's that old expression? You can lead the horse to the water, but you can't make it drink. So I can take you right up to the water's edge. I can give you the information and I can present it to you. But it's up to you, ladies and gentlemen, to do the research and educate yourselves. And that's what I hope this whole week of airing this information has inspired you to do. Now, I, I chose the three specific documentaries that I've aired this week out of the litany of the films that are out there about the subject of the attacks of 9-11 and how they didn't happen the way that you've been told. I picked them out because these three got the information across to you and there's there's much more information out there but if I'm looking in terms of opening up someone's eyes that are just coming to this subject with a, an open mind, at least willing to look at it. Maybe not all the way open, but willing enough to look at it or give me five minutes of their time. I wanted to choose the documentaries that I felt the audio and the evidence presented would compel them to listen since there's no visual and still keep them captivated for two hours. And I think I did a pretty good job. So, with that in mind, I want to get right to it. Tonight, I'm going to be airing the audio from one of the Loose Change films. The last one, you can find it on YouTube, Loose Change and American Coup. Loose Change and American Coup. I think the way that they laid out the last one, and um, the narration was done professionally, it's... It's presented in an easy-to-understand manner. And the information is all factual. You can do the research yourself and find out. And that's what I urge you to do. Anyway, let's get to the audio. Loose Change, an American Coup. February 27, 1933. At 9.27 p.m., a massive fire erupts inside the Reichstag, Germany's House of Parliament. Marinus van der Lubbe, a 24-year-old half-blind Dutch communist, is found half-naked behind the building and arrested on site. After an interrogation and trial, Marinus is beheaded three days before his 25th birthday. Historians argue that Gestapo police entered the Reichstag through an underground tunnel and soaked the building with chemicals and gasoline, with Marinus van der Lubbe arriving later to start the fire with his shirt. Later that evening, Adolf Hitler and Hermann Göring meet in front of the flaming debris to round up a list of communists and execute them that same night. The next day, Hitler passed the Reichstag fire decree which suspended most civil liberties and banned publications considered unfriendly to the Nazi cause. Hitler then takes Nazi control of the German parliament, passes the enabling acts, and begins his invasion of neighboring countries, starting with Poland. September 11, 1941. Ground is broken at the Pentagon in Arlington, Virginia, and construction begins. December 7, 1941. The Imperial Japanese Navy attacks the Pacific Fleet of the United States Navy at Pearl Harbor in Oahu, Hawaii. 2,403 Americans are killed, and an additional 1,178 are wounded. Although Roosevelt received multiple warnings indicating that an attack was imminent, he withholds this information and informs his commanders that negotiations with Japan are underway. The Pearl Harbor Investigating Committee hears the testimony of Admiral Kimmel, who was Navy head at Pearl Harbor at the time of the Jap sneak attack. We needed one thing. That thy vital need was the information available in Washington from the intercepted dispatch which told when and where Japan would probably the strike. I did not get this information. A number of government investigations concluded that there was considerable foreknowledge of the Japanese plans. 
Roosevelt declares December 7th an unprovoked and dastardly attack, an act of war between the United States and Japanese Empire, and asks for carte blanche to enter World War II. May 8, 1945. Nazi Germany formally surrenders to the World War II Allied forces. Beginning that month, the United States military begins recruiting the top rocket scientists from Nazi Germany. The project, known as Operation Paperclip, eventually included more than 100 individuals for the purpose of advancing America's technology. July 16, 1945. The Manhattan Project, a joint effort between the United States, United Kingdom, and Canada to develop strategic nuclear weapons, culminates with a detonation in New Mexico, nicknamed the Trinity Test. The detonation was equal to 19 kilotons of TNT and left a crater of radioactive glass 10 feet deep and a thousand feet wide. A variation of this bomb would later be used on two cities. Hiroshima, Japan. 70,000 people are instantly killed as a result. The bomb completely obliterated one square mile and started fires across almost five square miles, leaving almost nothing at the epicenter. 75% of the city was either heavily damaged or destroyed, and approximately 100,000 people died from radiation poisoning in the years that followed. Nagasaki, Japan. 40,000 are killed, and almost 30,000 are injured. The bomb destroyed one square mile and started fires almost two miles out. In the end, the Manhattan Project cost nearly two billion dollars and employed more than 130,000 people at three different facilities across three different states. Research and design at Los Alamos National Laboratory and two sites built explicitly for the project. Uranium enrichment at Oak Ridge in Tennessee and plutonium enrichment at the Hanford site in Washington State. At the time, it was the largest construction effort in United States history, and the entire operation was supervised by General Leslie Groves of the Army Corps of Engineers. Groves used a practice known as compartmentalization, which limits intelligence to a need-to-know basis and often leaves those working on the project in the dark. Entire communities and natives were literally packed up and moved out. Although tens of thousands of people were directly affected, the Manhattan Project was kept a secret. So secret that Vice President Harry Truman only became aware of it after President Roosevelt's death. General Groves himself claimed compartmentalization of knowledge was the very heart of security. Each man should know everything he needed to know and do his job and nothing else. To this day, much of the Manhattan Project remains classified. November 21st, 1945. The Nuremberg Trials, an international tribunal to convict the Nazi party of war crimes, commences in Germany. Twelve are executed. The rest are imprisoned, acquitted, or commit suicide before trial. Presidential jet, U.S. Air Force number one, printed on the side, 
And the crowd begins its cheer, which you can't hear. Well, the is now starting off the Elm Street, and it will be only a matter of minutes before he arrives at the trademark. I was on Simmons Freeway earlier, and even the freeway was jam-packed with spectators waiting their chance to see the president as he made his way towards the trade mart. Uh, it, it appears as though something has happened in the motorcade route. Something, I repeat, has happened in the motorcade route. There's numerous people running up the hill alongside Elm Street, there by the Simmons Freeway. Just a moment, please. Something has happened in the motorcade route. Stand by, please. The President of the United States is dead. August 4th, 1964. Two American ships report that they are being attacked by North Vietnamese military units in the Gulf of Tonkin off the coast of Vietnam. President Lyndon Baines Johnson immediately declares it an unprovoked attack and orders retaliatory strikes against North Vietnam, asking Congress to authorize action in Southeast Asia. Believing Johnson's claims, legislators act quickly, giving him carte blanche to use military forces in Vietnam. However, documents declassified from the National Security Agency in 2005 confirm that the attack never took place. The Tonkin Gulf Resolution was signed by President Johnson on August 10, 1964. This decree was the doorway through which the United States officially walked into Vietnam. In March 1968, while on a not very routine mission, a very hard, bitterly fought search and destroy mission in a free fire zone of South Vietnam, place called Pinkville, near Quang Nai, in the northern part of Vietnam. Um, the Army says that a platoon led by uh, First Lieutenant William L. Kelly Jr., a 26-year-old combat veteran, uh, the Army claims that they murdered 109 uh, Vietnamese villagers, mostly women and children. Kelly doesn't necessarily dispute that fact. What he says is, I was following orders. September 2000. The Project for a New American Century, a neoconservative think tank whose members include Dick Cheney, Donald Rumsfeld, Paul Wolfowitz, and Jeb Bush, releases their report entitled, Rebuilding America's Defenses. The report calls for a massive overhaul of the United States military and encourages fighting and winning multiple theater wars. They declare that the process of transformation, even if it brings revolutionary change, is likely to be a long one absent some catastrophic and catalyzing event, like a new Pearl Harbor. Seventeen of the project's participants would later take positions in the next White House administration. Eight years have passed since September 11, 2001. Although the World Trade Center is slowly being rebuilt, the family members and survivors are far from rebuilding the lives which were shattered on that fateful day. The 9-11 Commission, the official investigation into what happened, published its findings and closed its doors three years prior. Yet questions still remain in the minds of many. What could drive so many people to continue to question such a tragic event? The events of 9-11 were used to shape the Bush administration's entire foreign and domestic policy. If the details of the events are proven to be a lie, then the authenticity of the Bush administration's entire tenure should be in question. So we're going to take another look at September 11th, beginning with those reportedly responsible for the attacks. By the afternoon of 9-11, Osama bin Laden was officially being blamed for the attacks, though a number of international figures would question the United States' version of events, including Egyptian President Mubarak 
and General Hamid Ghul, the former head of Pakistani intelligence, who stated that 9-11 was pulled off by the Israeli intelligence service. On September 16th, bin Laden officially denies responsibility on Al Jazeera television. Regardless, Bush claims he wants bin Laden dead or alive, and the CIA is dispatched to Afghanistan to bring back his head in a box. On December 13th, 2001, the Department of Defense releases a videotape allegedly discovered in a house in Afghanistan. Osama bin Laden discusses the attacks, but does not take responsibility. American mainstream media and even President Bush would portray this videotape as absolute proof of his guilt, even though the translation was not conducted by a third party and was instead provided by the Department of Defense. International establishments and many others question the legitimacy of the tape. In a video aired on Al Jazeera three days before the 2004 presidential election, bin Laden reportedly claims responsibility for 9-11 for the first time. Al Jazeera does not say how they received the tape. The final bin Laden video was released in 2006. Does anyone else see a problem here? Osama bin Laden has never been captured or officially convicted for September 11, 2001. Although audio tapes attributed to him are occasionally released, as of this date, he is considered dead by most. As for the hijackers, the 19 hijackers were painted as radical Muslims, sneaking into the United States without any problem and raising zero suspicion as to what they were planning. First, they were not devout Muslims spending their last days preparing for paradise. In the months and weeks before the attacks, some of the hijackers are spotted several times at strip clubs and make several unexplained trips to Las Vegas. They drink heavily, receive lap dances, buy sex toys and sleep with prostitutes, spending thousands of dollars within hours. The 9-11 Commission claims that the United States only knew of three hijackers prior to the attacks, Nawaf al-Hamzi, Salem al-Hamzi, and Khalid al-Midar. For starters, Al-Qaeda Collins says he was paid $2,500 a month as an FBI informant in Phoenix. In a stunning disclosure to ABC News, he claims that three years before September 11th, he began providing the FBI with information about Hani Hanjar, a young Saudi who later helped fly hijacked American Airlines Flight 77 into the side of the Pentagon. They knew he lived in Phoenix. They knew his phone number. They, they knew, knew his address. address. They knew what he drove. Uh, they knew everything there was to know about the guy. The FBI emphatically denies that Collins provided any information about Hani Hanjar, but they do admit that they paid Collins to monitor the Islamic and Arab communities of Phoenix because of his unusual background. Once in Phoenix in 1996, the FBI asked Collins to focus on a group of young Arab men, many of whom were taking flying lessons. Hani Hanjar was part of the group. They drank alcohol, they uh, messed around with girls and stuff like that. They all lived in an apartment together, Hani and, and the others. Collins said he provided the FBI with basic facts, letting the FBI take it from there. Two of the hijackers even lived with an FBI informant in San Diego and were visited by Hani Hanjur and Mohammed Atta. Finally, an intelligence unit by the name of Abel Danger claimed to have identified Mohammed Atta and three other hijackers two years before 9-11. The Department of Defense and White House, of course, officially deny it. FBI Director Robert Mueller claimed that the hijackers gave no hint to those around them what they were about. However, this turns out to be far from the truth. 
Shortly after Ada arrived in the country, he tried to get the U.S. government to essentially finance his plot, seeking a loan from the Department of Agriculture. Janelle Bryant is the USDA loan officer in Homestead, Florida, who Ada approached in May of 2000. Bryant says it was this television commercial about how to borrow money from the government that led Ada to the USDA office, seeking $650,000 for what he described as crop dusting. He wanted to finance a twin-engine, six-passenger aircraft and uh, remove the, the seats. And he said he was an engineer and he wanted to build a chemical tank that would fit inside the aircraft. Bryant turned Ada down, but she spent more than an hour with him, talking, she says, of bin Laden, al-Qaeda, and targets. She says Ada became fixated with the aerial photo of Washington on her office wall. He pulled out a wad of cash about, the, about that big around and started uh, throwing money on my desk. He wanted that picture really bad. He asked about the Pentagon and the White House and uh, pointed them out. He asked about the Pentagon? Yes, sir, he did. In fact, he picked out where the Pentagon was. Brian says Ada also asked her about security at the World Trade Center and what she knew of Chicago, Seattle, and Los Angeles. Hijacker Hamza El Gamdi had a flight booked for later on the day of 9-11, and two after 9-11, one from L.A. to San Francisco, and two within Saudi Arabia. I'm going to pause it right there. We have a quick three-minute break sneaking up on us. But don't go anywhere. We'll be back in just a few short minutes. And when we get back, I will pick it up right where we're leaving off with the strangeness and complexities of the quote-unquote 9-11 hijackers. Stay tuned. We are back from break. Don't forget, if you go to federaljack.com, go to the download section. There is a 9-11 archive downloadable section. Click on the image It'll open up a download page. You can download everything that's there to research the events of 9-11 for yourself. So let's get right back into it. When we got cut off by the break, you were listening to evidence being presented about the quote-unquote 9-11 hijackers. Here we go. The complexities of the alleged hijackers are far and wide. We can only begin to scratch the surface here. They even managed to find hijacker Satam al sukami's passport, perfectly intact, on a sidewalk before the South Tower's collapse. Is it possible that the hijackers were merely patsies in a scheme much larger than themselves or Osama bin Laden? Uh, be careful where we stay on a loop, because these are being recorded and these tapes will be handed over. Everybody copy that? I'm glad I'm not flying today. <laughs> Don't worry, Jim, we'll carjack you on the way home. <laughs> Between September 2000 and June 2001, the Federal Aviation Administration, FAA, would send fighter jets to intercept errant aircraft 67 times. Interceptions were routine and usually occur within 10 minutes of a sign of trouble, such as losing radio contact and transponder signal, or flying off course. On September 11th, we are told that four commercial airliners were off course and out of communication, and not one of them could be intercepted. Never did in anybody's thought process about how to protect America did we ever think that uh, the evildoers would fly not one, but four commercial aircraft into precious U.S. targets. Never. Steve, I don't think anybody could have predicted that these people would take an airplane and slam it into the World Trade Center, take another one and slam it into the Pentagon. Nobody in our government, at least, and I don't think the prior government could envision flying airplanes into buildings on such a massive scale. But that turns out not to be true. U.S. military planners did envision and practice those very scenarios. As reported by USA Today, North American Aerospace Defense Command, NORAD, conducted exercises with fighter jets, simulating hijacked planes flown into the World Trade Center in the two years before the attacks. 
Pentagon planners also envisioned the attack on the Pentagon five months before it happened. According to this April 2001 Pentagon email, Air Force officials wanted a war game having a terrorist group hijack a commercial airline and fly it into the Pentagon. The idea was to check response times to launch fighter jets. But according to the Pentagon email, the plan was ultimately rejected by senior Pentagon officials as too unrealistic. Still to come are questions, big questions, about NORAD's response on the day of the attack. Why, despite all the exercises and the planning gear, jet fighters were not in place anywhere near New York or Washington. Quite an amazing story. Many thanks, Brian. Brian Ross. One of the drills executed prior to September 11th was called Amalgam Virgo. It was conducted in the beginning of June 2001 and simulated a series of successful terrorist attacks. Its purpose was to focus on unconventional threats like the hijacking of a commercial airliner, which would be crashed into the capital. One part of the exercise involved a Haitian AIDS victim who makes a deal with the Colombian drug cartel to crash a private jet into Tyndall Air Force Base in Florida in order to secure funding for AIDS patients. They even wrote up a suicide note for him. NORAD would deliver scripted messages from the FBI to controllers participating in the war games. And guess who was on the proposal's cover? Osama bin Laden. The second part of the exercise, which was planned before 9-11, but not executed until 2002, involved two Delta planes with actual pilots on the flight deck. FBI agents hijacked the planes and diverted them to secure locations. The FBI claims it has no records regarding this exercise. In fact, multiple war games were underway on 9-11 itself. But before we cover those... On the morning of September 11th, President Bush was in Florida to promote an education policy. At approximately 8.30 a.m., he left his hotel and headed for Booker Elementary School in Sarasota. Before entering the building, he was aware a plane had struck one of the Twin Towers. In fact, Bush claimed more than once that he saw the first strike live on television. This is impossible unless President Bush saw something the public has not. Video of the first strike was not broadcast until later that evening. Minutes after Flight 175 strikes the South Tower, Chief of Staff Andrew Card leans into President Bush's ear, whispering and walking away. And President Bush continues to listen to my pet goat. Despite the fact that both Twin Towers had been hit, and another plane was in the air and suspected to be hijacked, he remained at the school for a half hour, addressing the nation at 9.30 a.m. How could the Secret Service allow this? President Bush's itinerary had been public knowledge since September 7th. The only way Booker Elementary could not be considered a target was if the Secret Service knew for a fact that it wasn't. With that being said, September 11th was day two of Vigilant Guardian, an exercise staged by the Joint Chiefs of Staff and NORAD which simulated hijacked planes in the northeastern United States. It did so by placing inputs onto the screens of military controllers at the Northeast Air Defense Sector in Rome, New York, known as NEADS. As the attacks unfolded, controllers at NEADS thought that what they were watching was all part of an exercise. Okay, guys, listen up. Possibly a second hijack. Looking for a squawk, and I don't see it. We have smart terrorists today. They're not giving them a chance to squawk. What are the chances that a massive hijacking war game begins on the morning of September 11th that cripples the very defense sector in which the attacks take place? Better yet, who made the decision to schedule it on that date? Vigilant Guardian was a branch of Global Guardian, an Armageddon exercise being conducted at Offutt Air Force Base in cooperation with NORAD. Barksdale Air Force Base in Louisiana also participated in Global Guardian. Instead of returning directly to Washington, D.C., President Bush flew from Booker Elementary to both Barksdale and Offutt Air Force Base before returning to the White House. Another war game 
Northern Vigilance, moved fighter jets from unknown locations to bases in Canada and Alaska to monitor a fleet of Russian MiGs. Three F-16s from Andrews Air Force Base, located just 15 miles from the Pentagon, were flown 180 nautical miles away for a training mission in North Carolina, leaving them unable to defend the nation's capital. Langley Air Force Base, which is 130 miles from the Pentagon, would not launch fighter jets until 9.24 a.m., a half hour after the North Tower is struck and 10 minutes before the Pentagon. Although Major Kevin Nisipany at Neads ordered them to fly towards the capital, they are instead sent out to the Atlantic Ocean. When the Pentagon is hit at 9.37, they are 150 miles away, further than when they had started. To top it all off, the National Reconnaissance Office in Virginia, which monitors and controls the nation's satellites, began a drill at 8.45, conducted by a team from the CIA, in which a plane crashes into their headquarters. There are a number of other war games that have yet to be fully disclosed. So, let's review. On the morning of 9-11, the United States military is conducting war games in which fighter jets are flown out of the country, planes are crashed into buildings, and hijacked planes go in and out of radar, leaving military controllers confused regarding whether the events were real or an exercise. What a coincidence. Okay, and we're trying to locate any information as far as the location where he is currently, a mode 3. Do you have any information whatsoever? Um, I do not. Hold on one second. Here, so hold on. You heard that, right? Yep. You, 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 you. Oh, Cliff Hill, damn. Huh. Hmm. Good morning, New York. Okay, he was going to LA also. He was also going to LA. Now, um, somewhere, sir. Uh, I think he was from Boston also. Boston now, to LA. Let me tell you this. Nine thirty-seven a.m., Arlington, Virginia. American Airlines Flight seventy-seven crashes into the Pentagon killing 125 people and injuring hundreds more. Pentagon authorities deny that the building had anti-aircraft defenses. The FBI arrives within minutes, and the site is declared a federal crime scene, becoming their exclusive responsibility. The Pentagon initially denies that their cameras captured the crash. However, in March 2002, Five images are released to the press, though the Department of Defense does not take responsibility for their release. For years, those five frames were the only public footage of the Pentagon attack. That changes in October 2004, when Scott Bingham files a Freedom of Information Act requesting videotapes that captured the impact of Flight 77. Special Agent McGuire of the FBI located a CD-ROM that contains copies of two recordings made by security cameras, released on March 16, 2006.
a video taken from a Sitco gas station which is open only to Pentagon employees, released on September 15, 2006. And the Doubletree Hotel in Arlington, Virginia, released on December 7, 2006. As of this date, we still have no clear images of what happened at the Pentagon on the morning of 9-11. The official story goes as such. American Airlines Flight 77 was taken over by five hijackers, led by Hani Hanjour. Hanjour entered the United States in 1996 to become a professional airline pilot, though he did not complete a single course. On the morning of 9-11, Hani and his four accomplices traveled to Dulles International Airport outside Washington, D.C. They had spent the past weeks at the Valencia Motel in Laurel, Maryland, six miles from the National Security Agency. All five set off metal detectors and are subjected to additional screening. Yet, all of them proceed to board American Airlines Flight 77, which is described by the Washington Post as unusually light on passengers. Out of 188 seats, 64 would be filled. In fact, all four planes involved in 9-11 would be at approximately 30% capacity. The hijackers will board alongside Barbara Olson, the wife of Solicitor General Ted Olson, and a number of employees from Boeing, Raytheon, the Department of Defense, Lockheed Martin, American Airlines, the Navy, Army, and other government agencies. The hijackers would have only moments to subdue both pilots, remove them from the cockpit, and retain control of the plane. Flight 77 is allegedly taken over without incident at 8.51. No mayday, no evasive maneuver, no sign of struggle. All commercial pilots are trained to send a four-digit code, 7500, in the event of a hijacking. We are told that none of the four pilots on 9-11 did so. The plane soon after begins turning off course Flight 77's transponder shuts off, and it disappears completely from radar. Flight 77 allegedly flies completely undetected back to Washington from the Kentucky-Ohio border, reappearing on radar screens at 9.32. Had Hani Hanjour wanted to inflict maximum damage, all he had to do was nose down into the roof of the Pentagon. Instead, he begins a complicated 330-degree turn, dropping 7,000 feet and exposing himself for an extra three minutes while executing a maneuver described by experienced pilots as nearly impossible. In essence, an amateur pilot who was unable to control a Cessna in August 2001 executed this nearly impossible maneuver in a 757 with skilled precision a month later. Flight controllers at Dulles International Airport were convinced that the plane was a military aircraft. Tom Lewis is working radar at Dulles Airport. When my colleagues saw a target moving from the northwest to the southeast. And it was just a countdown, 10 miles west. And uh, she notified the supervisor. Nine miles west. But nobody knew that was a commercial flight at the time. Nobody knew that was American 77. What did you think? It was a military flight of some kind? Of I thought it was a military flight. I thought that uh, Langley had scrambled some fighters and... It was almost a sense of relief. This must be a fighter. Maybe one of them got up there. He was really moving fast. He was moving very fast. Like a military aircraft might move at a low altitude. This must be one of our guys sent in, scrambled to patrol our capital. The 757 allegedly descends over a Sheraton Hotel, Navy Annex, and Sitco gas station before crossing Washington Boulevard. Five light poles are struck and knocked out of the ground. One reportedly strikes a taxi. Flight 77 manages to hit the only section which was reinforced to withstand a terrorist attack. including reinforced steel and blast-resistant windows an inch and a half thick. The renovation, planning for which had begun in 1991, was only days away from completion. 
Ironically, had the plane struck anywhere else, the casualties and damage would have been far greater. An area that normally would have housed up to 5,000 occupants yielded only 125 casualties. The section hit was the headquarters of Naval Operations, Naval Intelligence, and Navy Command Center. Army personnel were also killed, along with a number of accountants and budget analysts. The Arlington County After Action Report states that important budget information was in the damaged area. So, what was left of Flight 77? Not much. These pictures were taken before the roof of the Pentagon had collapsed. The Pentagon's outer wall had a hole approximately 20 feet in diameter on the first and second floor, and visible damage 90 feet across the first floor. A Boeing 757 is 155 feet long, 44 feet high, has a 124-foot wingspan and weighs almost 100 tons. And it disappeared into this hole without leaving any substantial wreckage on the outside. There is no visible damage from where the wings or vertical stabilizer would have hit the building. The engines of a 757 are six tons each, comprised of both steel and titanium. If they slammed into the building at 500 miles per hour, where are the imprints? Where are the engines themselves? The 757 appears to have completely disappeared into the building. There are numerous parts to a 757 that are virtually indestructible, marked with a specific serial number tied back to the plane. To date, we have not seen a single piece positively identified as Flight 77s. Additionally, there was no impact damage to the lawn, meaning Flight 77 managed to strike the Pentagon while remaining a few feet above the ground. And out of the videos that have been released, none of them clearly depict a Boeing 757. Also, an exit hole inside the Pentagon is not explained by any official report. Despite what might have hit the building, why it was hit, is much more important. Norman Mineta was Secretary of Transportation from 2001 to 2006. On the morning of September 11th, when the first plane struck the World Trade Center, Mineta headed to the White House to enter the Presidential Emergency Operations Center, or PEOC. At the May 2003 hearing of the 9-11 Commission, Mineta testified the following. Uh, during the time that the airplane coming in to the Pentagon, uh, there was a young man who would come in and say to the vice president, the, the plane is 50 miles out, the plane is 30 miles out, and when it got down to the plane is 10 miles out, uh, the young man also said to the vice president, do the orders still stand? And uh, the vice president turned and whipped his neck around and said, of course the orders still stand. Have you heard anything to the contrary? However, the 9-11 Commission concludes that Dick Cheney did not reach the PEOC until 9.58, more than half an hour later. The Secret Service claims that it has no record of when Dick Cheney entered the bunker. What were the orders? If they were to intercept Flight 77, why was it allowed to strike the Pentagon? Let's go to the Trade Tower again, because, John, we now have a... What do we have? We don't... Wow. It looks like a, a new plume, a new large plume of smoke. That, that's the scene at this moment at the World Trade Center. Stan Daler from ABC's Good Morning America is down uh, in, in the general vicinity. Dan, can you tell us what has just happened? Yes, Peter. It's, it's Don Daler down here. I'm four blocks north of the World Trade Center. The second building that was hit by the plane has just completely collapsed. The entire building has just collapsed as if a demolition team set off, when you see the old demolition to these old buildings, it My pulled God. it down on itself and it is not there anymore. Generally speaking, for a building to collapse in on itself like that, it would seem to indicate that there could have been an explosion, a bomb planted on the ground that would make the building collapse within itself. 
10 o'clock Eastern time this morning, just collapsing on itself. This is a place where thousands of people work. We have no idea what caused this. Almost looks like one of those planned implosions. If you wish to bring uh, anybody who's ever watched a building being demolished on purpose knows that if you're going to do this, you have to get at the, at the under infrastructure of a building and bring it down. New York City, New York. The South Tower of the World Trade Center collapses to the ground in approximately 10 seconds. 29 minutes later, the North Tower follows suit, collapsing in approximately 10 seconds. Later that evening at 5.20 p.m., World Trade Center Building 7, a 47-story skyscraper 300 feet from the North Tower, suddenly collapses. The official explanation is that falling debris from the North Tower created a series of fatal fires inside the building. If this is true, it would be the third steel-framed skyscraper in history to collapse due to damage and fire. The first two would be the Twin Towers. August 5, 1970. One New York plaza, a 50-story office building, burned for over six hours between the 32nd and 36th floors. It did not collapse. February 23, 1991. One Meridian Plaza, a 38-story skyscraper in Philadelphia, burned for 18 hours across eight floors. It is later described by officials as the most significant fire of the century. It did not collapse. May 4th, 1988. First Interstate Bank, a 62-story skyscraper in Los Angeles, California, burns for almost four hours, destroying four floors and damaging a fifth. It was one of the most destructive fires in United States history. The building did not collapse. Gee, imagine that. Fires didn't bring down buildings constructed of steel and concrete. Gee, who would have thought of that? Oh, perhaps the engineers that actually built the building so that they wouldn't collapse due to fire. Hmm. Hmm. Maybe we should pay attention, huh? As I said earlier, ladies and gentlemen, go to federaljack.com. Go to the download section. Up at the top there, it says download section. Click on the download section. Opens up the page. You'll see a bunch of different images. My archives, JFK, 9-11. Click on the 9-11 one. It opens up the download page. Download everything. Research for yourself. Ask questions. Demand answers. We'll be right back. Ladies and gentlemen, we are back with our number two here on tonight's edition of Down the Rabbit Hole. I am your host, Popeye, from federaljack.com. As I said, in hour one, make sure you go to federaljack.com. There is a downloadable archive section there. Go to the download section, click on it. When you open it up, not only will you see the archives of my show and a JFK download section filled with information, plus others like the police state, miscellaneous videos and stuff. There's an entire section dedicated to the events of 9-11. Go there. You can download a ton of documentaries, PDFs, videos, audio go do the research ladies and gentlemen it's all there anyway back with our number two let's get right back to the audio loose change american coup loose change in american coup is what you're listening to you can find it on netflix you can find it on youtube when we left off we were at the part where they were discussing the evidence that high-rise fires have occurred ones with much more intensity around the world and here in the united states and the buildings didn't turn into dust and pretty much vaporize. So let's get right back into it. Here we go. Loose change in American coup. Even the Twin Towers survived a number of fires. 
first a series of fires in 1975, one of which was described as fighting a blowtorch. Then, another in 1999, on the 104th floor of the North Tower. Yet on September 11, 2001, the Twin Towers burned for 56 and 103 minutes before collapsing completely to the ground. One might argue that this was due to their construction. The Twin Towers were composed of 200,000 tons of steel. 425,000 cubic yards of concrete. 106 elevators. 43,600 windows. And a 360-foot television antenna atop the North Tower. The core of each tower was a rectangular pillar, 87 by 133 feet, comprised of 47 steel box columns ranging from 36 by 16 to 52 by 22 inches. The North Tower was completed in 1970, standing at 1,368 feet tall, and the South Tower was completed in 1973, clocking in at 1,362 feet tall, making them the tallest buildings in the world at the time. They were designed to withstand multiple impacts from a Boeing 707, which was the largest aircraft at the time. And we are told that these massive structures were destroyed by 10,000 gallons of jet fuel. A perfectly symmetrical collapse resulting from asymmetrical damage, with the collapse following the path of greatest resistance. The National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST, eventually concluded in August 2005 that they found no evidence suggesting that the Twin Towers were brought down in a controlled demolition. It's funny they would name it the report on the collapse of the Twin Towers, because the report does not explain how the Twin Towers actually collapsed, claiming that it does not actually include the structural behavior of the tower after initiation was reached and collapse became inevitable. 10,000 pages, and not a single one to actually explain how the towers came down the way they did. NIST admitted in April 2007 that they are unable to provide a full explanation of the total collapse, and also that they conducted no tests for explosive residue. Luckily, somebody has. My name is Jeanette McKinley. I was a resident of Lower Manhattan, living directly across the street from the World Trade Center on September 11th. I'd been living there for four years. I loved living there. When I think back about it, it's really the time of my life. And so on September 11th, I was uh, able to, I was writing emails. I was sitting at my computer, boom. I could immediately see the flames. I was close enough that I could literally just turn my head and there it was with the building burning. Uh, I was with my friend Jim Lecce. We watched everything out the window. He was fixated, taking photographs, and uh, whenever I mentioned leaving, he never wanted to leave. He said to me, this is history don't you realize we are watching history happen we, you know we're part of history why would we leave I was in the kitchen I was in my kitchen I had flowers in my hand and the building starts coming down our windows blew in he came running across the apartment get out of here the building is coming down well it sounded like it was coming down on us that cloud that the there was a debris cloud created by the um, when the tower two fell it just created a debris cloud which became part of our life because it just burst in our window at 50 miles an hour that whole cloud just came poof, bursting in and um, many people were wanting to investigate whether the collapses were actually controlled demolitions as many people thought on the very day even the news commentators thought they were controlled demolitions so there was a lot of controversy about whether they were or not and 
uh, friends of mine that knew that I had the dust were also um, knew a scientist, uh, Stephen Jones, and um, at BYU. My name is uh, Dr. Stephen Jones. I have a PhD in physics from Vanderbilt University, 1978. I have a Bachelor of Science degree from Brigham Young University, 1973. I graduated magna cum laude. I uh, went after PhD work. I did postdoctoral work at uh, Los Alamos Maison Physics Facility. Uh, in June 2007, I was examining a dust sample, which I'd obtained from Jeanette McKinley. Uh, I was using a loop and also just looking at it with my eyes and an ordinary uh, optical microscope, although stereo, so that I could see better in three dimensions. And what I found was uh, a chip that looked like it might be a pain chip. I mean, early on I was thinking, maybe not too interesting. But this chip was rather striking in its appearance. It, um, it had some, an orange-red color, first of all. And, and then I found several of these, and they all had some gray material adhering to the side of the red material. So layered, later we found multiple layers, but uh, most of these chips have two layers, red, gray. Uh, I did take one of these chips then to the electron microscope, the scanning electron microscope, and we looked at it uh, with the electron microscope, and then we used a system where we could determine the elements. Uh, what we found in the red material is a combination of aluminum and iron oxide, and uh, these are the components of thermite. Of course, now we looked with an electron microscope, we look deeper and deeper, a higher and higher magnification. And I pulled in a colleague of mine, Dr. Jeffrey Fair. He's an expert on the electron microscope machine. So he actually broke a piece off of one of these red chips, and then later he did four different samples, broke a piece off. That gives you a fresh surface. Because there, in the dust, there's all sorts of stuff. There's uh, zinc and titanium and calcium, all sorts of stuff. So you, he broke off a... a tip, you see, so we could look at a fresh surface, and then what you see in all four samples that we studied in this detail, carbon, which is significant, oxygen, iron, and aluminum. We looked at this, and uh, these again are the ingredients, except for the carbon, and we found that experimenters working with super thermite, trying to beef it up, make it more explosive, tailoring it to different uh, weapons applications, they would have silicon in there and uh, an organic material, which means a carbon. So a polymer, such as uh, Viton, they would add to this to give it the properties they wanted. So that fit. Now, see, that was surprising to me to see silicon and carbon, but then we find in the literature that's what these guys are doing in the weapons labs, Livermore and Los Alamos. Uh, they're, they're adding... Uh, organic, because that gives you a gas production. When the thermite goes off, now you also have gas production, which gives you the, the explosive force, for instance. I suggested that we take a sample of the, this red-gray chip material and run it through a very sens sensitive instrument called a differential scanning calorimeter. And he did that. What it does, you heat the temperature slowly, and the material will uh, react if it's going to. And if, if it reacts and produces heat, you'll get a spike in your calorimeter. And then if it reacts quickly, it'll be a narrow spike. If it, say, burns over a long period of time, you'll see a big broad spike. And the total area there is the total amount of energy released. And it gives you a lot of information. Uh, what we found, what Dr. Fair found first, and he was real excited when he told me about this, he took one of these chips and he put it in the differential scanning calorimeter and sure enough, it went off at right about 430 centigrade. But more importantly, the peak was high, which means a lot of energy released, and narrow, which means, in his terms, it blew up. You know, you said, man, this is it. This stuff blows up. It behaves just like nano. It has the ingredients of nanothermite. Uh, he said, well, uh, 
There should be, in a thermite reaction, you should produce molten iron. So you should see some spheres of iron. Think of uh, uh, spraying water in the air and you get droplets that are more or less spherical because the surface tension pulls the liquid into a sphere. It's very simple. Same thing with molten iron from the thermitic reaction, whether it's ordinary conventional thermite or the super nanothermite. <laughs> Either way, you get this molten iron and you should get these droplets of iron. So we said, we, we got to look for those. You know, If you don't find those, maybe uh, who knows what it is, but we got to find droplets of molten iron, otherwise we're not sure we had the thermite reaction, the thermitic reaction. In this case, it's a nanothermite. So we looked, and, and wow, what a beautiful sight. Uh, if, if you look at this, the, after the red materials reacted, there are these little spheres, just tons of them. And we compared uh, our, the traces that we got in this uh, sophisticated calorimeter with traces obtained with known thermite. These are published data. And our peak is actually narrower. I mean, this stuff goes off with uh, very rapidly and with and more energy also than had been reported by these other researchers working with known nanothermite. As if explosive residue in the dust was not enough, there are other disturbing aspects of the Twin Towers collapse. Both the North and South Tower collapsed at nearly free-fall speed. 110 stories, reducing itself to a pile of twisted steel and pulverized concrete and building materials in approximately 10 seconds. The Twin Towers combined contained almost 500,000 tons of concrete. This was turned into particles the size of talcum powder, blanketing lower Manhattan in a fine dust. It also turns out that molten metal exceeding 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit was discovered in the rubble of Ground Zero, underneath the Twin Towers and Building 7. Firefighters, emergency workers, police, officials, even Rudy Giuliani testified to these massive temperatures. Even after heavy rain on September 14th and 21st, a constant stream of fire retardants and water described as creating a giant lake these fires were not put out until December 13th, 2001, making it the longest burning structural fire in history. If one were going to bring down the Twin Towers in a controlled manner, you would have to simultaneously sever the 47 central support columns at the base of the building. Maybe that's why a large number of eyewitnesses reported massive explosions at the base of the Twin Towers, some before the planes had even impacted the building. In fact, large amounts of white smoke appear at the base of the South Tower just minutes before its collapse. Do you still think that jet fuel brought down the Twin Towers? In almost all the videos of the collapses, violent ejections appear 20 to 60 stories below the demolition wave. Here. 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 I know what you're thinking. If explosives or incendiaries were in the building, how would they get in there without anyone noticing? A December 2000 assessment of the World Trade Center recommended immediate renovation work on the steel columns contained within elevator shafts of both Twin Towers. Turner Construction, a company located on the 38th floor of the North Tower, was selected to do the job. Turner's CEO at the time was Tom Leppert, who had personal ties to George W. Bush and Carlos Gutierrez, Secretary of the Department of Commerce. The Department of Commerce is in charge of NIST, an agency that may sound familiar. Turner Construction also did fireproofing work on the very floors that were struck by Flights 11 and 175. 
Of course, all documents pertaining to Turner's work on the Twin Towers were destroyed on 9-11. In addition, President Bush's brother, Marvin, was on the board of directors at Securicom from 1993 until fiscal year 2000. Securicom, later known as Stratasec, was an electronic security company backed by Kuwait American Corporation, which provided security for United Airlines, Dulles International Airport, and from the early 1990s up to 9-11, the World Trade Center. According to the Port Authority, there are no records pertaining to the work that the company performed on the World Trade Center. So, a company with ties to the government agency that eventually investigated the collapse was responsible for doing renovation work inside the Twin Towers and the building security was run by a company with family ties to President Bush. And we have no records to prove what they did inside the buildings. Nothing suspicious there. I often get asked, well, how exactly how did they use this nanothermite in the buildings? It's, it's as if um, there are people just trying to cast doubt, as if if you can't explain everything, you have nothing. That's, of course, absurd. We have found explosive, unexploded, but explosive material in the dust. Now the next step is to find out who did it. So in other words, we've done the forensic CSI style science. Now we need the criminal investigation to go along with that to find out who could have made this stuff, first of all, and then who did make it. And then from there we can find out who ordered it being made and why. If only we could have examined the steel from the World Trade Center. Unfortunately, the debris was almost immediately shipped overseas, being sold to the lowest bidder. This is destruction and removal of evidence from a crime scene. Family members and engineers were outraged at the decision and demanded that the steel be preserved for investigation. Bill Manning of Fire Engineering Magazine publicly labeled the cleanup at Ground Zero a half-baked farce. Yet the operation continued until the site was officially clear on May 30th, 2002. Regardless of how it was done or who was responsible, what happened to the Twin Towers seems obvious enough. They were brought down in a highly engineered, unconventional, controlled demolition. It was a psychological attack on the American people, and it was pulled off with military precision. a.m. Shanksville, Pennsylvania. United Airlines Flight 93 allegedly crashes into an abandoned strip mine at 580 miles per hour, 20 minutes flying time from Washington, D.C. Speculation ran rampant that the plane had been shot down. First, the story was that passengers overtook the plane and sacrificed themselves to prevent further casualties. The 9-11 Commission eventually concluded that hijacker Ziad Jarrah crashed the plane into the ground. They also claim that the military did not know about Flight 93 until 10.07 a.m., four minutes after it had allegedly crashed. So, what trace was left of Flight 93? Yeah, we want to take our, our viewers live to uh, Shanksville, Pennsylvania. Our Brian Cabell is standing by. This, of course, is the site where United Airlines Flight 93 crashed on its way from Newark to San Francisco, crashed on Tuesday. And I understand in this investigation there's some breaking news. Brian, what can you tell us? Well, Darren, in the last hour or so, the FBI and the state police here have confirmed that they have cordoned off a second area about six to eight miles away from the crater here where this plane went down. This is apparently another debris site, which raises a number of questions. Why would debris from the plane, and they identified it specifically as being from this plane, why would debris be located six miles away? Could it have blown that far away? Seems highly unlikely. Almost all the debris found at this site is within 100 yards, 200 yards away. So it raises some questions. We don't want to over-speculate, of course. 
it seems to me from covering a number, a number of plane crashes on on the scene that if nothing else you can say this is not typical for a plane crash to be spread across an area this large it certainly doesn't make sense because most of the, the debris has been found in a very compact area within a hundred yards two hundred yards maybe a little beyond that and then all of a sudden they're telling us six miles away they have another concentration of debris they say it's very small pieces most of these are very small pieces most of the pieces here are no bigger than the size of a briefcase they say and the pieces six miles away maybe even smaller than that as for the crash site itself from the Somerset County coroner to the mayor of Shanksville almost every eyewitness would remark how little of the plane and its passengers remained at the actual crash site we have rescue vehicles that came in earlier in the day and they have turned up nothing no one believed to be alive from this crash within the last hour i want to get qu uh, quickly to chris kanicki he's a photographer with the uh, pittsburgh affiliate of fox affiliate he was back there just a couple of minutes ago and chris i've seen the pictures it looks like there's nothing there except for a hole in the ground uh... basically that's right the only thing you could see from where we were uh... was a big gouge in the earth and some broken trees we could see some people working, walking around in the area, but from where we could see, there wasn't much left. Any large pieces of debris at all? No, there was nothing, nothing that you could distinguish that a plane had crashed there. Smoke, fire? Nothing. It was absolutely quiet. It was uh, actually very quiet. Um, just a couple of people walking around. They looked like part of the NTSB crew walking around looking at the pieces. How big would you say that hole was? Uh, from my estimates, I would guess it was probably about 20 to 15 feet. Uh, long and a, probably about 10 feet long or 10 feet wide. What could you see on the ground, if anything, other than dirt and ash? And you couldn't see anything. You could just see dirt, ash, and people walking around, broken trees. There is zero historical precedent for a large commercial airplane and its passengers completely disintegrating upon impact, regardless of speed, cause, or crash site. Turkish Airlines Flight 981 began breaking apart in mid-air after suffering extreme decompression and crashed into a forest. All 346 people were killed. Forty bodies were recovered, six of them still in their seats. Air India Flight 182 was blown up in mid-air by a bomb over the Atlantic Ocean. Wreckage from the plane and 131 bodies were recovered, with autopsies performed. Japan Airlines Flight 123 suffered mechanical failures 12 minutes into its flight and crashed into a mountain. It remains the single deadliest aircraft incident in history. Wreckage and even four survivors out of the 500 passengers were recovered. Those are just three examples. And yet, on September 11, 2001, we are told that a 757 crashed into a field and left virtually no identifiable wreckage or passengers. I am going to pause it right there, ladies and gentlemen. The break is coming up in about 45 seconds. Before we get to it, I just wanted to let you know, for time purposes, to finish up the documentary, coming back in from break, I am going to pick it up right where it's leaving off and let it play through right to the end, which will include a performance by Remo Conscious of his song Welcome to the Aftermath so stay tuned for that I want to thank you all for listening and educating yourselves again go to federaljack.com in the download section there is a 9-11 downloadable archive section go in and download everything educate yourself research the events of 9-11 ask questions demand answers ladies and gentlemen Thank you all for listening. As I always tell you, the solutions to our problems are an inside job. Stay tuned. Three short minutes, and we will pick up with the final segment on the other side. The Department of Environmental Protection also reported in October 2001 that no trace of jet fuel was found in groundwater or soil at the crash site. Flight 93 allegedly crashed with over 5,000 gallons, 37,500 pounds, of jet fuel left. How is this possible? In 2006, during the trial of the alleged 20th hijacker Zacharias Mosawi, the FBI provided a batch of evidence that allegedly survived a catastrophic crash in near-perfect condition. Among the exhibits were 
a red bandana, a Kingdom of Saudi Arabia driver's license, John Talignani's driver's license, and flight attendant C.C. Lyle's personal effects, including her driver's license and Marriott hotel card. Although a 757 managed to obliterate itself upon impact, fragile material known as paper and fabric managed to survive nearly without a scratch. The FBI also releases pictures of an engine and two pieces of fuselage. It is unspecified where those were found. What really happened near Shanksville, Pennsylvania on 9-11 remains a mystery. But one thing seems clear. A 757 did not crash intact into a field in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. Pretty clear at one point, and then uh, this whole bunch of smoke and glass. And I think we're just about the last ones in this building right now. I think you should leave. Everybody else is gone. Okay. I'll just make sure that uh, there's nobody else coming downstairs. I hear the top of the building fell down. In 1984, construction began on World Trade Center Building 7, a 47 story office building 300 feet away from the North Tower. It opened to the public in 1987 and housed offices for Department of Defense, Internal Revenue Service, and was also the Secret Service's largest field office. Building 7 was considered the Central Intelligence Agency's largest station outside of Washington, D.C. The details of the office's functions remain classified. The Securities and Exchange Commission was also using the building to store three to 4,000 files related to their investigations. And, of course, they have no record of what those files were. On June 8, 1999, Mayor Rudolph Giuliani's Office of Emergency Management Command Center on the 23rd floor is opened. The new facility is located in downtown Manhattan, across the street from the World Trade Center's Twin Towers. The command center on the 23rd floor is bulletproof and bomb-resistant, with its own air supply and generators. It's linked to city airports, the Coast Guard, and the Pentagon. Computers will soon have detailed blueprints of every major building in New York City, as well as evacuation routes. Hurricanes and heat waves would be handled here, as well as terrorist attacks. Though New York officials say their facility is not impenetrable, they're confident it could handle even the worst crisis imaginable. Deborah Fayerick for CNN, New York. On the morning of 9-11, before the first plane strikes the North Tower, Building 7's alarm system was unexpectedly placed on test status at 6.47 a.m. for a scheduled period of eight hours. This normally occurs during maintenance, and any fire alarms from the building were to be disregarded. After the second plane strikes the South Tower, Building 7's power was deliberately shut off and its tenants evacuated. Following the collapse of the North Tower, Almost all of the surrounding World Trade Center buildings were completely destroyed, but the structures remained standing. Building 3, a 22-story building directly below the Twin Towers, was split in half by the South Tower's collapse. Although the building was severely crushed by falling debris, the structure remained standing. Building 4, a nine-story building east of the South Tower, was almost completely flattened. The remaining structure did not collapse. Building 5, a nine-story building east of the North Tower, suffered from severe fires and structural damage. Building 6, an eight-story building between the North Tower and Building 7, suffered a giant gouge in its roof and severe fires. Neither Building 5 or 6 suffered a collapse. Neither did the Deutsche Bank building, which stands to this day and is currently being demolished beam by beam. Neither did the Millennium Hotel across the street. Building 7, a 47-story office building hundreds of feet away, burns controllably over a few floors and suffers structural damage to its south face before collapsing completely to the ground at near free fall speed. The collapse of Building 7 was rarely reported on the day of and after 
Yeah, it, it's very uh, strange that that was not even hit by a jet and then it falls very rapidly and essentially straight down into its footprint. Although the collapse of Building 7 was clearly a phenomenon and further investigation was needed, the building steel was removed from the site and destroyed. No pieces were recovered from the debris for analysis. However, FEMA's volunteer investigators revealed after their limited studies that some pieces of steel from the rubble of Building 7 experienced something never before seen in an office fire. Some pieces of steel had large holes burned through them, evidence that a high temperature corrosive material had formed and burned through the beams, suggesting temperatures of over 1,000 degrees Celsius were present. But what the um, Worcester Polytechnic Institute uh, scientists reported was that steel, as they looked at it, using similar methods to what we've used uh, on the red-grade chips, these are electron microscope methods and uh, x-ray EDS methods, they found high temperature, indication of very high temperatures, oxidation and sulfidation, sulfur in the steel. Yet, this phenomenon will not be mentioned again, either by FEMA or other agencies investigating the collapse. Now let's fast forward to August of uh, last year, 2008. NIST finally came out with their preliminary report. Now, it's very interesting. They ruled out diesel fuel fires. They said it is due, and they also ruled out uh, any type of fatal damage from the towers collapsing, particularly the the North Tower, which is across the street, Vesey Street, I think. And so there's some damage, sure, but they ruled out it was not uh, fatal, and it did not contribute to the initiation of the collapse. That's what NIST said, and I agree with that. When questioned at a public comment session after the draft's release, NIST was forced to acknowledge that the collapse of WTC-7 experienced a period of freefall for 105 feet. That is acceleration at 32.2 feet per second squared, which is just dropping a ball in a vacuum, and that's how fast it accelerates. Finally, in their final report, they have this uh, agreement uh, having been w with Chandler and with my comment also that there was indeed acceleration, not just constant speed, and acceleration at the uh, acceleration due to gravity, in other words, free fall. And they even mentioned free fall for a, about 105 feet. That's about eight stories. Now that means, according to what they had previously said in August, which is correct, earlier, August 26th, nothing is in the way of the roof, nothing. Now you can see in the videos, there's a lot of, a lot of floor is still intact as the roof is, is moving as a block. So somewhere down below, there's about eight floors that have been obliterated. I mean, you can't just have the floors sitting there stationary because that would be mass in the way and that would slow this uh, acceleration down. Nothing's in the way. The only way I can see how to do that is with controlled demolition, with explosives to remove that. That's what you do in controlled demolition. You get all this material out of the way, then the upper block travels at uh, close to free fall. In this case, at free fall. It's really amazing. It's funny Stephen would mention explosives and material being removed. Two eyewitnesses independently claimed to news channels on 9-11 that they experienced an explosion inside the lower levels of Building 7. The first one is Michael Hess, who went on to UPN 9 News around 11.59 a.m. Oil refineries in Louisiana. And we have Frank Uciardo back on the phone with okay. us, Brenda, with uh, some New York City officials. Frank, go ahead. That's right. I'm standing here right now just off Broadway by City Hall with Michael Hess, who is the city's corporation counsel. Mr. Hess, you were trapped in, I believe, Seven World Trade Center. Go ahead, sir. Yes, I was. I was up in the emergency management center on the 23rd floor, and when all the power went out in the building, uh, another gentleman and I walked down to the 8th floor mm -hmm. where there was an explosion and we've been trapped on the eighth floor with smoke, thick smoke, all around us for about an hour and a half. But the New York Fire Department, as terrific as they are, just came and got us out. And the second is Barry Jennings, who went on to ABC7 shortly after noon. We're going to bring more of those to you now. Barry Jennings, you're on the eighth floor. You work for the city housing department. Explain to me the moment of impact. Well, me and Mr. Hesch, the Corporation Council, were on the 23rd floor. I told them we got to get, get out of here. 
We started walking down the stairs. We made it to the eighth floor. Big explosion. Blew it back into the eighth floor. And I turned to Hesh. I, I said, this is it. We're dead. We're, we're not going to make it out of here. I took uh, a fire extinguisher and I bust the window out. That's when this, general, this gentleman here heard my cries for help. We tracked Barry down in June 2007 to interview him and hopefully elaborate on his experience. Hi, my name is Barry Jennings. Um, I'm 52 years old. Um, I've worked for uh, 33 years at one location. Um, basically, like I said, I'm married. Uh, father of uh, four. It was very uh, funny. I was on my way to work. Uh, traffic was excellent. I received a call that uh, a small Cessna had hit the uh, World Trade Center. I was asked to go and uh, man the uh, Office of Emergency Management at the World Trade Center 7 on the 23rd floor. As I arrived there, there were police all in the lobby. They showed me the way to the elevator. We got up to the uh, 23rd floor. Me and Mr. Hess, who I didn't know was Mr. Hess at the time, we got to the 23rd floor. Uh, we couldn't get in. We had to go back down. Then security and police took us to the freight elevators where they took us back up, and we did get in. Upon arriving into the OEM uh, EOC, we noticed that everybody was gone. I saw coffee that was on a desk. Still, the smoke was still coming off the coffee. I saw, I saw uh, half-eaten sandwiches. And only me, Mr. Hess, was up there. After I called several individuals, one individual told me that um, to leave and leave right away. Mr. Hess came running back in and said, we're the only ones up here, we got to get out of here. He found the stairwell. When we reached the eighth or the sixth floor, the landing that we were standing on gave way. There was an explosion and the landing gave way. And we're, I was left there hanging. I had to climb back up and now I had to walk back up to the eighth floor. After getting to the eighth floor, everything was dark. It was dark and it was very, very hot. Very hot. I asked Mr. Hess to test the phones as I took a fire extinguisher and broke out the windows. Once I broke out the windows, I could see outside below me, I saw uh, police cars on fire, buses on fire. Uh, I looked one way, the building was there. I looked the other way, it was gone. Um, I was trapped in there for several hours. I was trapped in there when, when both buildings came down. The firefighters came, they came to the window, and because I was going to come out on the fire hose. I didn't want to stay there any longer, it was too hot. I was going to come out on the fire hose. And they came to the window, and they said, they started yelling, do not do that, you won't hold you. And then they ran away. See, I didn't know what was going on. That's when one, the first tower fell. When they started running, the first tower was coming down. I had, no, I had no way of knowing that. Then I saw them come back. Now I saw them come back with more concern on their faces. And then they ran away again. The second tower fell. So as they turned and ran the second time, the guy said, don't worry, we'll be back for you. And they did come back. This time they came back with 10 firefighters. Um, and they kept asking, where are you? We don't know where you are. I said, I'm on the north side of the building because when I was on the stairs, I saw north side. All this time, I'm hearing all type of explosions. All this time, I'm hearing explosions. And I'm thinking that maybe it's the uh, buses around me that were on fire, the cars were on fire. I don't see no, you know, but I'm still hearing these explosions. When they finally got to us, and they took us down to what what they they uh, called the lobby, because I asked them, I said, when we got down there, I said, where are we? He said, this was the lobby. And I said, you got to be kidding me. It was total ruins. Total ruins. Now, keep in mind, when I came in there, the lobby had nice escalators. It was a huge lobby. And for me to see what I saw, it was unbelievable. And the firefighter that took us down kept saying, do not look down. And I kept saying, why? He said, do not look down. And we were stepping over people. And you know you can feel when you're stepping over people. They took us out through a hole that the, I don't know who made this hole in this wall. That's how they got us out. They took us out through a hole, through the wall, to safety. 
As they were taking me out, one firefighter had fallen. I believe he was having a heart attack. But before that, this big giant police officer came to me. And he says, you have to run. I said, I can't run, my knees are swollen. He said, you're gonna have to get on your knees and crawl in. He said, because we have reports of more explosions. And that's when I started crawling. And I saw this guy fall behind me. And his comrades came to his aid. They dragged him to safety. Um, I was looking for, for an ambulance for my knees. And at that time, they told me, we got to walk 20 blocks to a um, to refuge. Uh, before I got there, I would, this news grabbed me and started interviewing me. Uh, and that, that's basically it. This is where the story takes a turn for the worst. In late August 2008, comments began appearing on YouTube videos of Barry's testimony, claiming he had passed away on August 19, 2008. Two days before NIST releases its draft report on WTC-7, which directly contradicts Barry's testimony and claims that no explosions occurred inside the building. They explicitly claim there were no witness reports of such a loud noise. To date, the only publicly available information is that Barry was in perfect health before suddenly being admitted to the hospital and subsequently passing away on August 19, 2008. A private investigator, when hired to investigate the disappearance of Barry Jennings, replied, Due to some of the information I have uncovered, I have determined that this is a job for the police. I have refunded your credit card. Please do not contact me again concerning this individual. In conclusion, two men inside World Trade Center Building 7, a skyscraper that housed numerous government agencies whose duties are unknown to the public, are almost killed by an explosion before either of the Twin Towers fell. Although it is damaged far less than any other surrounding World Trade Center buildings, at 5.20 p.m. it collapses into its own footprint, experiencing 105 feet of freefall and barely damaging surrounding structures. And the official government report, which takes almost seven years to write, says it was all due to fire. My mind is still there. You know, um, that day I'll never forget. And the, the explanations that were given to me is totally unacceptable. Totally unacceptable. Because as I stayed, I was there. I lived it. I lived through it. Actually, I thought I was going to die that day. Because me and Michael Hess did get on our knees and start praying. When we saw that there was nobody coming, there was no hope. We did get on our knees and start praying. Uh, and then there was the fireman that shined the light and says, anybody in here? Those are the sweetest words I ever heard. Is there anybody in here? And, and I, at that time, I told Mike, I said, Mike, you better get under the desk and pray to who you're going to pray to because I'm going to pray to who I'm going to pray to because it doesn't look like we're going to make it. And that's when that fireman came and, and saved our lives. When I got home, I sat down in front of the TV and I, my wife said, why do you keep watching this? Why do you keep... I couldn't stop watching it. And that's when I found out Building 7 came down. I was so surprised. And I'm saying to myself, why did that building come down? And I knew why it came down, because of the explosions. So... Where do we go from here? Your reaction to this will be either an emotional one or a logical one. You will deny that these things are possible and insist that this information is ridiculous and go about your life. Or you will acknowledge a number of serious glaring issues with the United States story of 9-11 and do your part to further a new criminal investigation into the day's events. How long will the American public or the world wait for the truth about September 11th? How much louder will the family members and survivors have to scream for answers? September 11th was not just a terrible tragedy that took the lives of thousands of innocent people. It was an American coup 
a violent and aggressive seizure of power and a transformation of both foreign and domestic policy. The slaughter of civilians in broad daylight as a means of promoting an agenda. This is not a new concept. Meet Smedley Butler. His father was both a lawyer and a politician. He was elected to the House of Representatives in 1897. He joined the Army at the age of 16, and at the age of 48, he became the Army's youngest Major General. He was twice decorated with the Congressional Medal of Honor. In July 1934, Butler was approached by two men who offered him $30 million and the support of 500,000 troops and the mainstream media to lead a coup against President Roosevelt and remove him from office. Butler pretended to go along with it, eventually meeting with the main conspirators behind the plot. The DuPont family and leaders of U.S. Steel, Heinz, Standard Oil, General Motors, Chase National Bank, Goodyear Tires, and last but certainly not least, Prescott Bush himself, President George W. Bush's grandfather. The intention was to install a fascist regime like the ones in Nazi Germany and Communist Russia in hopes of beating the Great Depression. Butler attempted to blow the whistle on the plot, testifying before a committee of House Representatives John McCormick and Samuel Dickstein. Want to guess what happened? The representatives believed Butler, but refused to pursue the people responsible. The media turned on Butler, calling his allegations a hoax, perfect moonshine, as one put it. President Roosevelt eventually cut a deal with the plotters, and nothing more came of it. America was hijacked on September 11, 2001. Not by Osama bin Laden and his Al-Qaeda network with box cutters directed from a cave in Afghanistan. But by a group of tyrants, ready and willing to do whatever is necessary to keep their stranglehold on the United States of America. A group beyond any one man or any one administration. Until there is a new investigation into the events, we will not go away. We will not be silent. Ask questions. Demand answers. We saw the towers for the ashes like they were laced with bars. And ever since we've been in war like kings. Calm and fetus for a fascist world state. An Orwellian nightmare with we'll righteous drip bag. Get prepared for the future of wide taps. Cameras on every corner. Blackwater sharpshooters with scopes locked on ya. The Patriot Act has us watching our backs in front. Like they're here to save us while they're on the attack. And we act. Like we didn't see it coming from a nation built by theft and genocide Gun it down, opposition, listen, worldwide is well known That America will eat its own, so so long to what you thought was democratic These times are catastrophic, cause war is a means to profit Control and manipulate the masses, it's classic evil Caskets be full of people, blasted They lie, they scam, they cheat, and still They plot, they fund, they act, it's real they watch, they hunt, they punish and kill Welcome to the aftermath They lie, they scam, they cheat and steal They plot, they fund, they act, it's real They watch, they hunt, they punish and kill Welcome to the aftermath Ground zero, the launch pad for endless killing The Bush desperately needed to fool the millions And right. supporting right. an agenda to conquer the planet I wonder how the children felt when the first bomb landed in Afghanistan Operation Enduring Freedom was the first act of treason Must I tell you the reason start reading And stop believing network news And concerned with making money, not telling the truth Deep in the night, I'm turning and tossing No more cities are burning, lost in the silence of the empire's coffin Over a million Iraqis murdered Human beings never to be Seen again or heard of Now who's next in the name of America famous for heinous war Acts being insane leaders Feed us lies and ignore facts But fact is we're smarter and stronger Than what they hope for The war on terror deceptive Like Reagan's Cold War They lie, they scam, they cheat and steal They plot, they fund, they act, it's real They watch, they hunt, they punish and kill Welcome to the aftermath They lie, they scam, they cheat and steal They plot, they fund, they act, it's real they watch, they hunt, they punish and kill Welcome to the aftermath 
20 years from now, what will Americans be like? Slaves will behave the human beings with rights that we fight. You might still have a chance instead of hoping for change. We gotta advance, take a stance and be heard. Silence is the enemy. Worries have power, but actions speak loud and pretend to be free. Till you die a slave, a soldier in the desert searching for a ghost in the cave for the corporation. I run out of patience, sick of seeing troops sent to die for your lies. Spending dollars in debt, we holler in protest till we have your arrest. We will not rest, and we know, we know, we know what you did that day. Killed your own citizens to advance your ways. All my real patriots stand up and say, 9 11 was an inside job. They lie, they scam, they cheat, and steal. They plot, they fund, they act, it's real. They watch, they hunt, they punish, and kill. Welcome to the aftermath. They lie, they scam, they cheat, and steal. They plot, they fund, they act, it's real. They watch, they hunt, they punish and kill Welcome to the aftermath